So, today we are going to start uh, the second part of module 5, which is on the subject of solution of linear algebraic equations, but using advanced methods. We have seen uh, to briefly recap that we have a standard uh, scalar transport equation and if we discretize it, we finally get uh, a set of linear algebraic equations or linearized uh, algebraic equations and it is a solution of these that we seek because the solution of this will give us the values of the variable in this case phi at the grid point uh, i comma j. Okay. So, we have seen that the solution of uh, a x equal to b or a phi equal to b is not a trivial thing for CFD type of problems because we would we would like to have and given the computational resources at our uh, disposal we tend to have large number of grid points and large number of grid point means large system of equations to be solved. So, we need to be very careful in terms of what kind of methods we choose to solve this. We made the point that the Kramer's rule is cannot be used for more than 30 equations and uh, uh, 30 grid points and methods uh, established methods for the solution of Ax equal to b like Gaussian elimination, LED decomposition. Uh, although they are very general, they are not so good as some other methods like the iterative methods uh, that we have also seen in the first part of this module. We saw two basic iterative methods the Jacobi method and the Gauss-Seidel Gauss method and we have seen that these are fairly easy to implement and uh, write programs for and uh, they tend to have uh, an arithmetic operation count which varies as n square where n is the number of equations to be solved compared to n cubed for Gaussian elimination or uh, uh, LU decomposition method. We have also seen one very good direct method, the tridiagonal algorithm, in which the operation count varies as n, but that is not uh, applicable for the general case, it is applicable only, if only for one dimensional problem, one dimensional problem with uh, three diagonals. And uh, so, when you look at the more generic method, then those are n cubed, whereas the basic iterative methods that we have seen uh, vary as n square for a class of problems related to uh, like those have uh, happening in CFD type of problems. And uh, we have uh, also seen that, that uh, in these uh, iterative methods, we do not solve A x equal to b directly and we solve it in an indirect way like uh, like q x k equal to q minus a times x k minus 1 plus b and approach the solution asymptotically. And uh, in the Jacobi method q is the diagonal all the diagonal elements of a and therefore, this uh, iteration becomes like x k equal to m x k minus 1 plus n. And similarly, in the gauss seidel method we choose q to be the lower triangular part of a including the diagonal elements and that again can be put in the form of x k equal to m x k minus 1 plus n. Once you have this kind of formulation of the problem, then we solve uh, with uh, an initial guess which can be arbitrary in the case of convergent schemes. We start with any initial guess and then we get x 1 from you put x 1 here you get x 2 and so on and then we keep on doing it and uh, eventually the solution converges is uh, in for a convergent scheme. We also saw that in actual computations of A x equal to b using the Jacobi method and gauss seidel method, we do not do matrix inversion, but we rewrite them in this simple way. We reposition them in the simple way, so as to get uh, an estimated value of x 1 k plus 1, x 2 k plus 1 x 3 k plus 1 all the way up to x n minus k plus 1 and x n k plus 1 in a sequential way using all the guess values or the last previous iteration values of the uh, of all the other variables. And uh, we have also seen that 
the way that we solve uh, the gauss seidel method and jacob method they are slightly different in the gauss seidel method we make use of the updated solution of some of the variables wherever they become available we make use of the updated one where the updated one is not available we make use of the old solution okay but and we have also seen that the number of uh, uh, multiplications or divisions varies as n square and uh, we still have to do a lot of uh, iterations but because we have a as a very sparse matrix both gauss seidel method and jacobi method can take advantage of the sparseness and do this multiplication uh, uh, operations only on those non zero coefficients so that the actual number of arithmetic operations uh, uh, to go from step k to step k plus 1 is only of the order of phi n for a 2D and for 7n for a 3D compact molecule. Okay. But we also saw that the actual number of arithmetic operations depends on how many times we have to solve uh, this x k plus 1 equal to m x k minus 1 plus n in order to get uh, uh, a solution that is fairly close to the true solution. So, and we also saw one of the characteristics that these methods do not work in all cases. We have taken this simple three unknown equations uh, problem with three equations and the solution can be seen to be 1, 2, 3 for x1, x2, x3. And for this thing where we know a solution, we know the solution and we can show that the solution is unique. We find that the Jacobi method works very quickly to it gets into that within uh, uh, 3, 4, 4, 5 iterations whereas uh, the gauss seidel method diverges. So to that extent although these methods are simple they do not always work and the gauss seidel method even though it is updating it is making use of the latest value is not necessarily faster or better than Jacobi method. So we need to do a proper convergence analysis and we start with that convergence analysis in, in the second part of this and uh, we look at how we can we establish that there are certain conditions in which these iterative methods can be convergent and then we look at uh, what we call as the asymptotic rate of convergence and we characterize an iterative method by this rate of convergence also among other things and then we show that there are certain methods which are better than these basic methods in terms of the convergence rate and we discuss a few of those things. So this is what we are going to do in uh, uh, part B and we start with the convergence analysis. So in iterative methods we have Ax equal to be solved as xk plus 1 equal to Pxk plus q for k greater than or equal to 0. So k equal to 0 is the initial guess and from that we get x1, x2, x3 and so on if we define error epsilon here as x double dot minus x where x double dot is the exact solution that double dot is just a, an easy way of writing it using the script language that is available. So it does not have any it is not like acceleration of x it is not like d square x by dt square it is just a symbol okay it is just to distinguish between the exact solution which is this x double dot and the current solution which is x k. Okay. So the exact solution is such that when, when you substitute uh, x double dot into this you get uh, ax equal to ax double dot equal to b and this satisfies this equation it also satisfies this equation. So we also have x double dot equal to px double dot plus q. So this is the exact solution and if you know the exact solution and if you know the current solution x then you can define error as the exact solution minus the current solution. So you can say that the error at the kth iteration is the exact solution which is always the same for a given ax equal to b minus xk and we also have xk such that once you put this is only this is the one by which we are getting xk or xk plus 1 
and if you have xk you can put that into this equation and find out what is axk and axk need not be equal to b okay so it's equal to bk okay so the difference between bk and b is what is known as the residual and this residual means that there's a residual amount of dissatisfaction or unsatisfaction of the given equation ax equal to b by the current uh, value xk so if you substitute xk into this equation and then you get bk and if bk is equal to b then xk is the exact solution because it's satisfying this equation so the difference between b and bk is therefore the uh, amount of non satisfaction of the equation uh, ax equal to b by our current guess or current estimated value of xk so this is the residual amount that still needs to be satisfied okay so how can we get that we can put this delta k as b minus axk although we cannot compute error because we don't know the true solution we can readily compute the residual because in order to compute the residual you just have b which is known because the problem is given and then xk is the current uh, estimate value so we know this and a is also known so b minus axk is the residual if the residual is zero the solution has converged okay if it is not zero it has not converged and we need to do more if the residual is very very small then we can say it's okay it's uh, pretty close to the solution if it is satisfactory to me then i'll take it okay if it's satisfactory to me in the sense that it's not there's nothing personal here if if i i see the previous iteration value and the current iteration value and if the two differ by only in the fifth decimal place or the eighth decimal place then maybe i say that okay it's accurate enough for my purposes and i can stop okay so we'd like to re, uh, decrease the residual and when you look at it closely this delta k k is the superscript telling us how many iterations we have done starting from the initial guess but this delta here is not for a single equation it is for the entire set of equations and since we are writing delta k equal to b minus bk b and bk are both column vectors so delta k is also a column vector so that means that it indicates the amount of non satisfaction of ax equal to b for each equation okay so that means that when you say delta k residual is zero that means that each value of this column vector must be zero that means that each of the uh, n equations of ax equal to b must be satisfied or they should be so small now how do we say that this delta k is small because delta k is set of numbers for the first equation it's 0.0015 second equation maybe 0.3025 maybe for the third equation 0.20117 something like that so what is small and which one of these is small we bring in the concept of norm of this vector okay so the norm can be the largest of these n elements is one measure of the of the norm is a measure of the bigness of the magnitude of the elements that are there in that particular vector okay so it can be the uh, maximum value of uh, uh, of uh, delta of any element of delta must be less than certain value is one particular way of saying that every equation needs to be satisfied to within this much tolerance or you can say that some uh, root mean square value of uh, of all the elements must be so much so that that's uh, equivalent to an l2 norm uh, kind of thing okay so uh, we can define those kind of norms of the vector and in this case the vector is the residual and then we can look for the norm of this residual vector to be smaller than a certain value and if you say that if it's smaller than that value then you can say i've got a solution which which i 
feel is close enough and typically what, what kind of uh, values do we say? We would like to have a delta uh, uh, k which is a small fraction of the delta 0. Okay. You have x 0 to start with and then you can put that x 0 here and then you get b 0. So, b 0 minus b, b minus b 0 will give you delta 0 and we would like delta k to be reduced by orders of magnitude compared to the original value of delta and that seems to be a good way of measuring what is small because small is with respect to what you started out with. If you put the problem in kilometers, you will get small values 1.2, but if you express the same thing in meters, it will become 1200 and if you express the same thing in millimeters, then it will become 12 million or 1.2 million. And uh, uh, so, in that sense, it is not the number because the number changes with the units. We would like to make sure that the, the residual is changing relatively. So, that is why we can say that delta not delta 0 divided by delta k should be less than should be about greater than say 10 to the power 3 or 10 to the power 4. We we know that delta k is decreasing as k is uh, increasing because it is a convergent scheme. So, we are uh, scheme. So, we are slowly slowly approaching that. Uh, so, in, in that sense we would like the delta k to be uh, at least uh, say 1000 times smaller or 10000 times smaller uh, than the beginning value. So, we, uh, we look for orders of magnitude reduction of the residual. Okay. So, how many iterations does it take to reduce the order of magnitude uh, of the residual by a factor of 10 or a factor of e is known as uh, asymptotic convergence rate. We will come to that shortly. Okay. So, if we, we have this one here and we have this, if you subtract this from this you get x double dot minus x k plus 1 is epsilon k plus 1. So, the error at k plus 1 is p times x double dot minus x k. So, that is error at k this and q and q will cancel out. So, by subtracting this from this you can say that error at k plus 1 is p times error at k. So, in the simplest sense if epsilons were not vectors, if p is not a matrix. Okay. So, then you could say p is a, a multiplication factor. Okay. So, the error at uh, k is being multiplied by a factor given by p and that is the error at k plus 1. So, this multiplication factor or the amplification factor is, uh, uh, is how the error is changing and it does not, it is not constant the multiplication factor, but it is an indication of whether the scheme is convergent and how, uh, how fast it is converging. If obviously, if p is less than 1, if it is a scalar, then you could say you have a convergent scheme because if p is 0 0.9, next time it is only 0 0.9 of the current value, next time it is 0 0.9 times 0 0.9, 0 0.81. So, in that sense, it is gradually decreasing. So, at the end of m iterations, you can say that the error at m, this should have been a superscript, is p raised power m times error at 0. So, if p is less than 1 in magnitude, then you can say the error is decreasing at this rate, okay, at, a, at, a, at a rate which is a function of this magnitude of p. Okay. So, what is this magnitude of p here? It is again not some, uh, uh, it is not the magnitude of the, uh, it is not the norm of p or anything like that. Uh, what we are looking at is an error which is uh, governed by uh, its eigenvalues. Okay. And uh, so, the uh, we have something called the largest, the spectral radius uh, of the iteration matrix p and spectral radius is the largest eigenvalue. Okay. Given that we are dealing with A which has real coefficients and uh, no imaginary coefficients, 
we expect the eigenvalues of p to be real okay and we say that so at the end of m iterations the error at, uh, uh, at after m iterations where this m should be superscript here is equal to p raise power m times error at the first iteration and uh, uh, if p is less than 1 then we can see that the error at n step will be less than the error at this and each time it is being it is being reduced by a factor which is given by the magnitude of p. Now, in this particular case p is not uh, uh, some simple factor the residual usually uh, varies in, in a non uh, it can vary in a monotonic way like this and in some cases it can even increase and then decrease ok. So, here we have at kth iteration we have x k and we can compute x a x k equal to b k and then we define this uh, uh, residual k and residual reduction is not uniform it does not decrease at the same rate along with iteration number, but uh, one can do some mathematics and say that it is governed by the eigenvalues of the iteration matrix and these eigenvalues are going to be uh, some are going to be large and some are going to be small there are n number of eigenvalues for uh, n system of equations. So, if you have million grid points you will have million eigenvalues ok. So, all of those eigenvalues will be contributing to the reduction of error at all the time, but those eigenvalues which are small will die out first their influence dies out first and the largest eigenvalue is the one which is going to ultimately determine the rate at which how fast the residual is decreasing ok. So, as you go through this uh, uh, iteration uh, number initially you have usually a steep variation because the small eigenvalue contribution is decreasing pretty fast and eventually when you put this on a log scale and this on a log scale uh, ok log scale and this this is linear you will see something like uh, uh, a logarithmic decrease gradual uh, uh, decrease with uh, a slope which is no longer changing ok. So, in this part there are different eigenvalues and all of them are contributing here and sometimes they contribute in such a way that initially the error does not decrease in especially in practical CFD computations, but then it eventually starts decreasing and as it gets closer to the solution then it will be decreasing at a constant rate at a slope which is uh, essentially the slope of this residual versus iteration number tells us at what rate it is decreasing ok. So, this uh, the constant slope at which it is decreasing for large number of iterations for large number of it uh, 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 m here is known as the asymptotic rate of convergence ok. So, that asymptotic rate of convergence is governed by the largest of the eigenvalues of the iteration matrix and that is known as the spectral radius of the iteration matrix. So, we need to know the spectral radius we need we do not need to know all the eigenvalues all the million eigenvalues we need to know what is the largest eigenvalue. If the largest eigenvalue is less than 1 then we have a converging method and the rate at which it converges depends on uh, on uh, the uh, spectral radius of this. So, we will come back to this as I mentioned you have uh, n by n matrix here and uh, if you have uh, a million grid points million unknowns you will have million eigenvalues ok and uh, there is no uh, easy way of finding all these eigenvalues, but for some class of problems it is possible to get a theoretical expression for the eigenvalue. For example, for central differencing of the Laplace scheme Laplace equation in 2D with Dirichlet boundary conditions we have done this. Uh, uh, so, with uniform spacing in x and y and having m by m. Uh, that is m square number of grid points. So, we have in the x direction 
m grid points and and in the y direction we have again uh, m grid points so that we have a total number of m square grid points the spectral radius of the iteration matrix with the jacobi scheme is given by cosine pi by m okay so that's roughly equal to 1 minus pi square by 2m square for large values of m so that is if you have a few divisions like you have a 4 by 4 matrix then this may not be applicable but if you have 40 by 40 or 100 by 100 for large value of uh, uh, divisions m here then the largest eigen value is given by 1 minus pi square by 2 m square now what does this mean this means that if you are looking at m equal to 50 then this is equal to 1 minus pi square pi square is about 10 by 2 m square this m is also in the denominator okay so that means that 2 by 50 square 2 by 2500 so that is uh, the total will be uh, 10 by 5000 so that is 1 by uh, uh, 1000 so this will be equal to 0 0.999 this whole thing will be equal to 0 0.001 so 1 minus 0 0.001 is the uh, um, uh, is the uh, uh, largest eigenvalue okay if you take m to be 100 then this is 1 minus 10 by 2 times uh, 100 square so that is uh, 2 times 20, uh, 10 to the power of 4 1 by 10 by 20000 uh, 20, so this eigen value largest eigen value will be 0.9998 okay so it has increased it has increased from already large value of 0 0.999 to even larger value of 0 0.9998 now what's the difference the rate of convergence is determined by how far away from one the spectral radius is okay so in one case in the case of m equal to 50 it is away by 0 0.001 in the case of m equal to 100 it's away by 0 0.0002 so that means it's away by a factor of 5 and so that means that the convergence rate will be lo uh, lower will be less for larger value of m so as m increases then the spectral radius approaches 1 and the closer it is to 1 the slower it is to converge okay now for this gauss seidel scheme for the same laplace equation 2d with the same uh, kind of number of divisions here the spectral radius is known theoretically to be cosine square pi by m here it is cosine pi by m and so that is 1 minus pi square by m square whereas here it is 1 minus pi square by 2 m square this 2 is uh, this whole thing is in the denominator and what does this mean here if you have m equal to 50 and pi square is 10 so 10 by 250 uh, 2500 so that is 0.996 so uh, instead of 0 0.999 it is 0 0.996 and for m equal to 1000 uh, m equal to 100 this will be 0 0.9999 and not uh, uh, whatever the value that we had uh, earlier uh, you know it is 0 0.999 and we had 0 0.9998 so that means that the spectral radius for a gauss seidel method for this problem is always less than the spectral radius for the Jacobi method and since the spectral radius determines the asymptotic rate of convergence for large values m, m from this we can say that the gauss seidel method for this particular problem where we know the spectral radius analytically uh, is faster than the Jacobian method okay Jacobi method and uh, we can also show that it is uh, faster by a factor of 2 okay for large values of m and uh, uh, we would also like to mention that in these methods it is not all the eigenvalues that are contributing to the rate of convergence it is only the largest eigenvalue that is contributing to the rate of convergence there are other methods where even these values intermediate values of eigenvalues will also contribute to this okay so 
other thing we would like to mention here is that as m increases for the same method the spectral radius approaches is uh, closer to the value of uh, 1 and therefore it, uh, it becomes slower and slower. Okay. So, what we would like to take from this uh, first lesson of, uh, uh, of part 2 of this advanced methods through a, some convergence analysis we have essentially shown that for a typical iterative method the residual the error and the residual decrease as a function of the uh, the rate of decrease is determined by the eigenvalues of the iteration matrix and if the iteration matrix changes then the conversion behavior also changes. We have also seen the condition that for convergence the spectral radius of the iteration matrix should be less than 1 and the rate at which it converges under asymptotic conditions that is for large values of m in which the influence of the uh, smaller eigenvalues dies out is given by the spectral radius the closer it is to 1 the slower it is to converge okay for we don't know this eigenvalues for the general case okay so in the specific case of laplace equation 2d racially boundary conditions jacobi method uniform spacing and all that then there are certain uh, mathematical formulas uh, expressions we can derive and these expressions show that the jacobi method uh, has a higher spectral radius than the gauss seidel method for the same uh, uh, grid spacing and all that and therefore it converges slowly and its rate of convergence asymptotic rate of convergence is uh, twice uh, is half as much as the jacobi method okay so this is the kind of uh, uh, error reduction that we can expect and for large values of uh, uh, m the iteration number the residual decreases at a constant rate and that constant rate is expressed like this for the error to re decrease by a constant factor okay it's not a summative factor it's a multiplicative or divisive factor okay so it's a by a constant factor multiplicative factor then it takes the same number of iterations so that is if you are looking specifically at, uh, uh, at uh, error reduction by a factor of 10 then it is given the number of iterations is given by 1 by minus ln of 1 minus uh, rho here. Okay. So, we have rho is a spectral radius. So, uh, ln of 1 minus rho uh, is the 1 by uh, ln of 1 minus rho is the uh, rate at which is the number of iterations which are required to reduce the, uh, the error by a factor of e which is 2.71 uh, uh, or something like that. So, if you want to reduce the error by a factor of 10 then it will take you uh, 2.3 times log of uh, 2.3 divided by log of uh, uh, 1 minus uh, rho there and uh, so that that fixes the number of the if you put this on a log scale here and then if you put the uh, iteration number on a linear scale then to go from say fourth decimal to fifth decimal it takes so many number of iterations and then from fifth decimal to sixth decimal then it takes again the same number of iterations and 6 decimal to 7 to decimal again it takes the same number of iterations. So, you can in a way you can anticipate how many more iterations you have to do in order to get convergence to within the 5th decimal or 6th decimal 7th decimal like that and you can stop at some point. So, in usual conventional practice for the usual solutions where you are not demanding huge amount of accuracy you could say that I would like to stop my iteration once my residual decreases by a factor of 10 to the power 4 or 10 to the power 5 from the initial residual and uh, so 
if you take that kind of thing and given that there is a, a faster reduction here and given that this is slower reduction typically you would like to bring this down to a very low value and this determines the total number of uh, arithmetic operations uh, 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 iteration numbers that are needed for this and that number varies as it is estimated to be about point, uh, uh, 466 n where n is the number of equations okay a, num a number of unknowns okay so it's about 0.5 n for every tenfold decrease in the residual reduction okay so if you are looking at five orders of magnitude of reduction then it will take 2.5 n number of iterations in order to reduce the residual by a factor of uh, uh, 5 and get to our closure stoppage of the iteration. So, that means that you start with some guess value and you carry out 2 and a half times n number of uh, iterations to get to the final value in uh, your uh, gauss seidel method or uh, 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 Jacobi method. So, it is something proportional to n and each step takes about 5 n or 7 n number of uh, arithmetic operations. So, the total number of arithmetic operations is the number of operations per step times the total number of steps that you want to take. So, the first step is 5 n for a 2 D problem and that is the uh, number of uh, arithmetic operations per step and you have to take something like 2.5 n number of steps. So, the total number of arithmetic operations is 5 n times 2.5 n. So, that is about 12.5 n square. So, that means that in the Jacobi method or the uh, gauss seidel method in for this Laplace problem you can say that it takes about 10 to 15 n square number of arithmetic operations where n is the number of unknowns number of grid points and this needs to be compared with n cube by 3 number of arithmetic operations which are required for the Gaussian elimination method. Okay. So, if your n is of the order of 100 then maybe there is not but that much of a difference, but if you have a million grid points which is not unusual then your Gaussian elimination would take million cubed. So, that is 10 to the power 18 number of arithmetic operations and Gauss Seidel method will take only 15 times n square. So, that is 15 times 10 to the power 12. So, this is 10 to the power 13 number of uh, arithmetic operations. So, there is a huge difference between Gaussian elimination and Gauss uh, Seidel method for such kind of problems, which is why typically these Jacobi method and uh, uh, Gaussian uh, Gauss Seidel method can be used for most of the problems uh, where uh, you have diagonal dominance and in such case this is uh, it takes n square number of operations and therefore, these are considered to be superior to the uh, other uh, to the Gaussian elimination or those type of direct methods. So, in the next lecture we will see how we can improve on this convergence rate of n square number of operations. <coughs>